Thank you, Brittany. My name is uh, Vincent Kumenda. Um, I work with MHub, a technology and innovation hub in, in Malawi. We mostly work with um, emerging entrepreneurs in the technology space uh, by supporting them uh, on how to solve like social issues using technology. But, but we've recently also entered the digitalized space in, in a way of supporting them that they should understand um, what is expected of them when they go online because they create a lot of content and they're working with a lot of people interested in the digital space. So we've started programs that are supporting them how best to run um, uh, programs, but also to understand the digital rights and responsibilities that they have uh, online. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Brittany. I am Ali Wissau from the Gambia, the country coordinator for the Given Project Gambia. It's a youth-led organization in 34 countries, but each country has your own reality on issues on the ground that you work on. In the Gambia, we train young girls on how to code on leadership programs as well. And then in 2016, after the internet shutdown in the Gambia, as an advocacy group, we started advocating for digital rights in the country. Bon uh, après-midi. Do you please, do you please put on your headset? Uh, uh, je reprends au nom de Jean-Paul Hurunziza. Je suis du, du Burundi. Je suis membre du chapitre Burundi de l'Internet Society. Uh, <coughs> J'ai commencé dans le domaine des technologies de l'information uh, quand j'étais un peu plus jeune. Uh, j'étais membre d'une organisation de jeunesse et puis par après je suis Euh, j'ai été membre fondateur du chapitre Burundi de, de l'ISOC. Euh, je, je suis rentré dans le domaine des droits numériques euh, comme euh, chercheur où je menais des recherches pour le compte d'une organisation qui s'appelle CIPESA euh, depuis 2014. Et puis maintenant, je suis, euh, je suis en train d'essayer de mobiliser euh, les organisations impliquées dans les droits de l'homme au Burundi pour qu'elles intègrent le volet des droits numériques. Merci. Ok. Je m'appelle Emmanuel. My name is Emmanuel. I'm coming from Togo. I work with Param Initiative as a Google Policy Fellow for Francophone Africa. And um, how do I go to digital rights space? I think is very recent. I was more involved in the internet governance, multi I mean, the internet governance forum, which I'm a convener. So I was more involved in the internet governance until um, 2016, 2016, where the frustration started online. So. I ask myself, right now I'm not on Facebook for one reason, because I've been kidnapped for publication on Facebook, which is a personal story. And after that, I was asked to delete my Facebook account, and I never returned. So from that frustration, I feel like it was very important to actually uh, go forward, because I was working more on freedom of expression as a media person, because I was a journalist. And I realized that today we are, I'm a web journalist, so it's very important to actually fight, advocate for digital rights so that the space should be open to everyone. So that's what I did, engaging with uh, party initiative. And uh, I used to be their former fellow to look at the works they do, both digital inclusion and digital rights. So I think it was on the course of the fellowship I realized that there was a lot to do, in my country especially, because it was almost an empty space where nobody actually advocates for that, apart of few people you may know. So, well, how that adventure started, so I engaged with our initiative with the policy fellow. I decided to focus first on my country, which is Togo, and also the other francophone space like Senegal, Mali, in Western Africa and Central Africa. So. That has been the, my arrival in the space. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, but I won't leave Jean-Claude alone, uh, Jean-Paul alone. So I will turn to French. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
solidarity thing. <laughs> okay. Bon. Euh, je suis informaticien à la, à la base, euh, comme Jean-Paul. Et, euh, et on a régulièrement travaillé sur les pays d'Afrique centrale comme... Euh, euh, sur les, sur les questions d'utilisation de la technologie pour améliorer la redevabilité du gouvernement et euh, pour encourager la participation citoyenne dans les politiques publiques. Alors ça, c'était notre euh, point d'entrée dans les questions d'activisme de, de la société civile. Je pense qu'on a été quasi obligé de nous engager dans les questions de droits digitaux D'abord parce que c'était un peu plus naturel pour nous, puisque quand on évoque les, les droits digitaux, la partie digitale évoque les technologies de l'information. On a été poussé à y rentrer à cause d'un événement dans notre pays, le, le Cameroun, euh, la coupure de la connexion Internet euh, que nous avons connue euh, vers la fin de l'année 2016 jusqu'en la, 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 jusqu jusqu fin du premier trimestre 2000. 2017 et, et, et qui nous a comme on dit en anglais prompté un peu pour que nous puissions rentrer dans l'espace et où nous avons compris que il était impératif que nous euh, nous nous engagions pour faire des, des droits humains parce qu'au fond quand on évoque les droits digitaux c'est les droits humains qu'on s'engage dans la promotion des droits humains en utilisant l'expertise que nous avons sur ces questions de technologie de l'information et pour accompagner aussi les, la société civile qui n'est pas nécessairement très au fait des questions de technologie de l'information. Donc voilà ce que je peux dire de manière synthétique sur ce qui nous a poussé dans cet espace. Merci. All right, so our goal with the panel today is to kind of get a questions of bridging the gap between digital rights. So as more and more people become come online, how is it you teach them about digital rights so that they look at technology as something that is their right and not just an access to things like Facebook or WhatsApp or Google? Um, and to try and share those lessons learned and hear from you as well about the work that you've done in this space to see what kind of solutions and lessons we can take from this into our lives beyond this work. The five panelists are all currently interviews partners, which is how I've gotten to know them and seen their work. And so I think there's a lot of really important lessons that we can pull out of the work that they've done so far. So to kick us off, I would ask them, or and then maybe you in a second, uh, when we talk about the internet, or at least when we used to speak about the internet, we viewed it as kind of like a global village, right? It's the thing that everyone could use to communicate with each other and to access information. And there was a lot of promise to it. Um, But today, I, my question is, has this held true, do you think? Um, or are we seeing the same kind of inequalities that have spread offline, slowly spreading to the online space as well? And if you could talk about that a little bit more. I'm just gonna... Jean-Paul. Oh, en français, pardon. Uh, la question, c'est, uh, au tout début de l'Internet, on voyait l'Internet un petit peu comme un village global, où tout le monde avait accès à l'information, tout le monde pouvait échanger. Mais je dirais que de plus en plus, on a un peu l'impression que l'Internet est devenu un endroit où les mêmes inégalités qui existent, euh, disons, dans le monde réel, le monde de tous les jours, euh, se propagent maintenant sur l'Internet. Et je me demandais si vous pouviez parler un petit peu de votre expérience dans ce domaine-là euh, et les inégalités que vous voyez dans votre, dans votre travail. Oui, merci. Euh euh, comme vous le dites, Internet a un grand potentiel pour euh, connecter tout le monde. D'ailleurs, la, la technologie d'Internet euh, elle est, elle est ouverte, elle est, elle est conçue pour être accessible. Mais malheureusement, dans la pratique, euh, euh, depuis il y, a, il y a déjà une trentaine d'années que l'Internet est là, mais on remarque, par exemple, que chez nous, au Burundi, le, le taux de pénétration d'Internet est, est maintenant à 7,3%. Ça, c'est les chiffres de, de fin 2018. Cela veut dire que eh, 92, pratiquement 92% de, de la population de, de mon pays est, est exclue. Eh, je suis content que le forum ait intitulé eh, « Droit et inclusion numérique ». Donc, 
c'est une bonne chose que l'on puisse discuter justement de comment euh, inclure ceux qui sont exclus. Voilà. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree. Um, the internet space now is, is, is a global village. I'll, I'll give an example of um, um, our country like Malawi now. Um, more and more things are, are being pushed online, more and more services, a lot of opportunities that young people are getting online. But, but still more, even though it's a global village, we still have a lot of issues when it comes to uh, maybe the internet penetration rate. In Malawi, it's now at 10%. That, that means a lot more people are missing out on all these services that we're pushing online. Um, so so it, it's a very important thing for us as, as a technology hub because we're working with a lot of young people who are creating content each and every day. They're being used by, by, by different people in, in power and, and who have got influence to create a lot more content that can be accessed by a lot of people. But at the end of the day, they're not really uh, reaching the people that they need to get at the end of the day. Because um, for some, it, it, it's a marketplace um, for, for e-commerce, for e-learning platforms and, and all that. They can only reach um, um, a small um, percentage of the population. So that, that's why we, we, we're standing up and, and, and talking about the digital rights, but also digital inclusion should, should be part of the conversation that we, 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 we're having uh, or in, in Malawi. So yes, um, the internet is, is a global village and we should do a, a lot more to bring more people online that they should access all the services that we're pushing online. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that question. Um, like every sector in our society is connected to the internet. Like for instance, in the Gambia, uh, is around 18% of the people connected online. So you look at like almost how many people, like 82% of the people are not connected online. And even those that are connected online is very expensive. Like you talk about one gigabyte mobile data consumption is around five dollars, and some people consume this a day. So you look at like um, the average earning of a Gambian, like. We depend like on most of the people depend less than one dollar a day. So if you need like five dollars to have one gigabyte, it's really expensive. And then you look at the other communities that are not connected. So the internet, like the educational institutions, you have hospitals. All those who need the internet are definitely not connected. And you know this could be attributed to a lot of stuff. Some do not even have power connections to be able to be connected to the internet. So it's all related and the inequality is just so big in, in, in where I come from. Okay. I I think in my side or my experience across at least three African countries where I've lived before, I think the inequality I mean the internet came to us as how the democracy came, you know. So it was the same as how the electricity came in Africa. Those in the urban communities will enjoy it first, the elite will enjoy it first, and later on we'll think about the others. And I don't really think we even think about the others. Is when the partners say that we want those that are not unconnected in this particular zone to be connected before you get the loan or the grant, that's the moment where you see them deploying, you know, backbones, fiber optic, and everything in those communities. So there's not really that political will, because I say political will because they, they are the policy makers. They decide where to connect, where to bring the electricity, because Africa, we talk about internet, but electricity comes first. So they decide on which community to be the connected, and I think the that has been a very huge problem and it's also a capitalism because when you take countries like my country uh, where the private sector is not developed when it comes to the telcos because most of the telcos are owned by the states but you see those telcos owned by the states connecting only the urban communities where they can get their return on investment so building a tower or deploying fiber optic to a particular zone mean they will get the return on investment. It's not really bringing the internet as a tool, bringing the internet to the citizen as water, as necessity. So I think it has been that since, since we got the internet till now. So 
the inequality starts from there. And also, as they mentioned, the inclusion, the digital inclusion. Because you can't go online if you don't know how to use the tool. That's one thing. So how many programs do we have when it comes to ICT in our curriculums? OK, I'll just give a funny example. In my country, for example, those who do the clerks, the secretary schools, even the government secretary school, they are still using the typing machine. Right now, if they are going to the exam, it's even difficult to get those machines because it's not even on the market. They start typing with those machines again in 2019. So you ask yourself, if you finish high school, going to university, and you, like, you only learn to type on those machines, how are you going to get connected one day? Mm -hmm. So I think it's quite both uh, related. Inclusion plus the internet, they go together. We can't separate them. Oui, je d'emblée, je, je, je me reconnais dans tous les avis qui ont été formulés, euh, parce que étant tous des pays africains ici, on se, on se ressemble pour la plupart quand on regarde les, les causes et les conséquences de tout ce que nous vivons. Donc, euh, je me reconnais. Mais je vais simplement ajouter, euh, je vais simplement ajouter le fait que les technologies de l'information et notamment euh, avec ce qu'Internet est venu crée une amplification extraordinaire du bien et du mal, en fait. C'est-à-dire que s'il y a des, des contraintes comme celles que nous évoquons ici, elles s'amplifient fatalement. C'est-à-dire que la, la fracture que l'on appelait à l'époque la fracture numérique, qui devient aujourd'hui une fracture digitale, elle se crée et elle prend des proportions qui, qui justifient le fait qu'on puisse travailler à à ces droits digitaux et qui justifie le fait qu'on puisse travailler non pas seulement aux droits digitaux, mais aussi qu'on intègre la, la, la question de l'inclusion. Et ça, euh, vous allez voir ces questions d'inclusion sur euh, 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 la qualité, par exemple, des contenus. La vérité, c'est que quand vous regardez nos zones rurales, euh, dans le monde, le monde courant, offline, comme on dit aujourd'hui, vous avez des différences d'alphabétisation qui sont criards. Bon, si en plus, des gens savent parler leur langue et ne peuvent pas parler dans la langue que l'on utilise sur Internet, pour ne prendre qu'un seul exemple, ils sont de facto exclus, quelle que soit la qualité des droits que l'on peut leur accorder dans les textes de loi. C'est-à-dire, même si Internet est, est connecté ou du moins est disponible tout le temps, et gratuitement, il est évident que ces personnes iront sur, Internet, euh, iront sur Internet pour ne rien profiter de ça, parce que la langue, dans, la langue des contenus qu'il y a sur Internet les exclut automatiquement. Bon, là, c'est un exemple qui montre bien que euh, pendant que nous traitons, que nous identifions ces contraintes et que nous évoquons de lutter contre, il faut que nous tenions compte de l'aspect de l'inclusion à tout point de vue en partant de mon point de vue du contenu, parce que après la connectivité, Emmanuel vient d'en parler, quand on aura mis tous les pylônes, quand on aura mis l'électricité dans tous les villages, après il faut bien qu'on traite la question de contenu, qui est aussi le problème que nous posons ici quand on travaille en français et en anglais avec les interprètes et tout ça. Donc c'est une question qui pour moi est fondamentale, au-delà des questions de prix, pour lesquelles je pense que aussi, on ne va pas le dire euh, plus que ça n'a été dit ici. Les prix sont également une question qui exclut naturellement les franges de nos populations qui n'ont pas les moyens. Merci. All right, so we've covered some of the reasons why the internet isn't accessible or isn't an option for some people. Electricity, costs, people who live in rural areas, language barriers, not understanding how to actually access the internet because it's not something you've seen before. But all of you have decided to work in the area of digital rights, regardless of low penetration rates um, or things like that. And so I'm wondering, as you approach digital rights in your context, First, why is this something you thought was important? And you, brief, you covered it briefly at the beginning. But how do you reach people about digital rights and tell them about the importance of the internet in a way that doesn't make it sound like a luxury? How do you bridge that gap? Let me go with Shelly at the other end, because he waved his yeah. arms. Proceed. Alors, comment est-ce qu'on atteint le genre? Je pense qu'il faut... 
il faut qu'on choisisse quel est l'angle d'attaque qui, euh, qui est le meilleur. Dans la plupart des démarches que je constate sur les problématiques diverses que la société civile entreprend dans, dans les pays où j'ai travaillé, l'Afrique centrale notamment et peut-être un peu l'Afrique australe, je me rends bien compte qu'on a toujours une, une attitude top-down des ONG urbaines qui viennent de la ville et qui, et qui sont un peu dans une posture coloniale. On replique un peu. Donc on sort de la ville, on a les moyens d'accéder aux bailleurs de fonds et évidemment, euh, nous savons écrire les propositions, c'est nous qui avons de l'argent et c'est nous qui descendons pour travailler avec les, les gens dans les, justement les zones reculées qui ont besoin de nous. Je, je, je pense que euh, notre attitude, et, et grâce d'ailleurs à un financement que nous avons reçu de Internews, notre attitude a été de, euh, sous leur conseil aussi, notre attitude a été de penser qu'on peut capaciter les acteurs qui sont dans ces régions-là, qui sont dans ces espaces, parce que ces acteurs peuvent mieux, mieux parler de leurs problèmes, ils le ressentent encore mieux que nous. La, la vérité se trouve là. Si je prends l'exemple de la coupure Internet que nous avons eue au Cameroun, qui était, euh, pour dire vrai, une exclusion ponctuelle, conjoncturelle, qui n'était pas structurelle dans ce cas, on peut bien noter qu'il est plus difficile pour le le francophone que je suis et qui habite à Yaoundé, dans la capitale, où on n'a pas de coupure Internet, où on a relativement l'accès à la plupart des services sociaux ou des services économiques, il est quand même plus difficile pour moi d'être crédible si c'est moi qui parle de, du shutdown et de ses conséquences. Je crois que l'idéal, c'était justement de rendre capable ceux-là qui se trouvent dans ces zones et qui vivent mieux ces problèmes et qui peuvent les porter à l'attention de euh, à l'attention de ceux-là qui légifèrent chez nous ou à l'attention de ceux-là qui prennent les décisions pour couper Internet ou pour lever la coupure. Et dans le cas d'espèces, ça n'annule en rien les compétences que nous avons comme Afro-Leadership ou bien comme euh, expert des TIC ou quoi que ce soit, ça ne l'annule pas. Ça donne simplement un mode d'expression qui est, de mon point de vue, plus amplificateur parce que ça permet qu'on ne se positionne pas en docteur, pas en donneur de leçons mais en des partenaires qui peuvent travailler avec des collaborateurs sur le terrain et qui, eux, sont plus capables que nous de nous dire ce qu'ils vivent dans les régions où ils se trouvent. Et je pense que c'est de cette manière-là qu'on a pu bâtir la coalition qu'on a bâtie au Cameroun. C'était de rencontrer, d'ailleurs je vois quelques membres de cette coalition dans cette salle, c'était de les, de les rencontrer là où ils sont et de leur dire qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour les aider, ou du moins, pour les aider à lever eux-mêmes le problème qu'ils rencontrent dans leur zone, et ne pas paraître devenir un peu des, des messies et des sauveurs qui viendraient les aider. Je pense que ça, c'est une approche, et on voit certainement d'autres. Merci. Excellent. Donc, il faut faire un sommaire, de rencontrer les gens où ils sont, et de discuter avec eux de leurs problèmes, c'est une façon de le faire. Uh, Vincent, I think you had thoughts. Um, for, for us, we're working mostly with uh, the people in the technology space. So for the past five years, we've been building a community of, of people um, um, in, in the technology space. We've worked with them. At first, we were helping them to develop like proper business models, access funding, or, and, and eventually maybe solve some of the social issues that we face in Malawi. But then we started to see a trend in, in, in a way that when people are trying to approach these young techies, so you, you should understand that uh, Malawi being a country that is just developing technologically, um, these guys are, are like a layer breed. Everyone is looking for the skills and, and they eventually go to them. So uh, apart from maybe the normal way of getting business from them, they will also use them to do some things online that will not lead a, will, will not lead a very good. For, for instance, we, we, we just approaching elections now and they will be forced maybe to um, create fake accounts, um, talk about fake news, And, and do a lot of stuff that maybe people are interested in, in even hacking other people's emails because they're looking at, at maybe the skills that these guys have. Uh, so, so for us, um, we, we sort of venturing to the space to support them, to help them understand how best they can um, conduct themselves online, apart from maybe using the skills that they have to, to um, generate revenue or whatever it is that they want, but they also need to be responsible with the content that they're creating and how they're being used in, in online. That's why we entered in this space. So to work with them well, 
we went straight into the area that they understand better using technology. So first of all, there are two very important pieces of registration in Malawi that, that came, I think, in 2016. Um, government passed what is called the E-Transactions Act, which uh, stipulates things that um, um, people can do online, the fines and, and, and all the things around privacy and, and all that. But we found out, uh, having conducted a research, we found that most of the techies that we're working with didn't really understand this piece of registration. The other uh, registration is the Communications Act, I think of 1998, um, government amended in 2016 just to add in um, the uh, online component and, and recognize some of the activities that happen online. So um, these people, uh, as much as they are very well skilled, they are doing a lot of work online, they could not understand these two pieces of registration. And some would fall victim of, of, of this registration. So we thought of uh, finding them in the space. Uh, we started with developing um, a Facebook Messenger chatbot which um, like detailed um, the whole um, election transaction act that these young techies can access very easily. Maybe reading PDF documents, maybe reading Word documents can, can be a bit difficult for them. So we thought of them giving them a chatbot that they can t interact with to understand what is expected of them in, in this uh, piece of registration. So it, 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 it went very well with them. They understood it very well and they, um, and they know a lot more about um, the registration than, than, than before. And we went a step further to go to universities where these young people are graduating from and start talking about digital rights. How, what, what do they understand? What do they know about the policy environment in Malawi? And uh, how, how best can they uh, even contribute to, to the space? So we've seen a lot of positives, a lot of changes in, in, in the way these young people are conducting themselves online and also the way they're being used by people of, of influence and those that have got power in, in, in that space. So we, we, we're happy to say that it's working for us in, in the technology space and we also engaging other um, uh, sectors, uh, for instance, the media, um, uh, academics, and, and anyone who is interested in the, in the space. So that's the approach that we took uh, in Malawi. Awesome. So reach out to the tech community. Teach them about digital rights and the actual impact of their work is one way of kind of spreading digital rights at the, the core and the ground level. Um, Elieu, I think you had an interesting way of teaching people about digital rights and the internet using tools that they already have. Basically, for us in the Gambia, like, our, you know, we were in a dictatorship for 22 years. It's a story that we always tell to serve as a better example for best practice that other people can learn from. Uh, it was a very repressive government. A lot of people had to leave the country to go to the diaspora. And then in connecting back to the political activities of the country, there was no other platform than the internet like a series of websites were created by Gambian dissidents outside, you know, getting information out of the government to educate the population. And you know, one of the ways that uh, this government try to stay in power is suppressing information. And then for us, they targeted, they went straight to the internet because there were not many radios in the country. And even the radios that were there were censored. So there was this information act that was enacted like, uh, in 2013 with a heavy fine that is if you even uh, criticize a public official on, on, on social media, you can go to court, they can jail you and a lot of other stuff like people cannot even go back to the Gambia. So, and then rumors started coming out about uh, internet shutdown because we saw network interference with the internet started getting very slow, very expensive until few days before the election because it was unimaginable or whatever you want to call it like can, is there a mean for a government to shut down an internet? We never experienced this before. So a lot of people took it for granted. Now it's never going to happen. They didn't just stop at shutting down the internet, but even communications, telephone communication, no one can call from outside to the Gambia and from Gambia to outside. It was not possible. And then this was like uh, an eye opener for a lot of people because basically everyone depends on the internet for a lot of things that is happening in the country. So we didn't know where to turn to, and then those in the diaspora started sending links, but who are you sending the link to who doesn't have an internet connection? You can, you can, you can use a VPN to navigate around the system, but those in the country during the election period do not have any of those means to even see these things were posted online from the Gambian community in the diaspora. So we started engaging the stakeholders, the communities, finding out like what is the problem. We later realized, okay, they said, they shutting down the internet for security reasons. And then we went to check, is there even a law that should allow for the internet, for them to shut down the internet? We realized internet laws are almost non-existent in the Gambia. You ask policymakers, they don't even know what was happening. 
our group as an advocacy organization started venturing into this because later we went to the Internet Governance Forum in Mexico. That was when we went to receive a prize there. So we made all these stakeholders learn from them the best practices that have been happening in other countries. And then, thank God, there was a transition that was happening in that month. So after there was a new government, which heavily relied on the Internet during the campaign to reach out to people. And then the president even acknowledges, like, social media has contributed greatly to his election victory. But it is government, they will praise it when it is in their favor. But the moment they get comfortable with it, and it, they, start, they also start to see it as a threat. So but we didn't stop there. We started advocating for those bad draconian laws to be repealed. We engaged the new National Assembly members during the different forums that we organize in communities, bringing all stakeholders, those in the health sector environment, to tell them the importance of the internet and how an internet shutdown or interference would affect the work that they are doing, citing the example of the 2016 election. And then the high court, the case was taken to the high court. They uh, ruled out that the 2013 Information Act was illegal, like unconstitutional, but they still, there were some clauses that they left, like when you still criticize the president, you can be liable to certain crimes and stuff. So the work is continuing. Gambia right now is writing a new constitution. So with help from Internews, we've been engaging our lawmakers, the, the various stakeholders in our communities. We had a digital rights forum where we invite all of them. They came, we had like a series of speakers, panels, to discuss about some of these things and then the recommendation therein that we're presenting to the Constitutional Review Commission to have a consideration into getting it into the new constitution because it is not every time you get a new constitution. The last time Gambia had one was 1997. Before that, I can't even remember. So maybe we wouldn't have another chance to have a new constitution to get some of these new emerging issues like digital rights to be included in our constitution. Maybe it's going to be in the next 100 years. So this is the moment that we also try to take a chance to involve the stakeholders to, to get things done. Awesome, and I think the Gambia is sort of a unique example in that it's, again, not often that you get to revise your constitution and include digital rights in the actual constitution. Um, but I think the piece about educating lawmakers and reaching out to them and teaching them about digital rights, that is something that is applicable, I think, across all contexts in the world, I would go so far as to say. Um, Jean-Paul, you do a lot of interesting work, ou tu fais beaucoup de travail euh, intéressant avec euh, travailler avec des groupes plus traditionnels dans le domaine des droits humains. Je me demandais si tu pourrais nous parler un petit peu plus des arguments que tu utilises, des conversations euh, que tu entretiens avec ces groupes-là. Bon, merci. <coughs> Effectivement, euh, grâce au, au soutien d'Internews, j'ai imaginé qu'il faudrait impliquer les, organi les organisations traditionnellement impliquées dans les droits humains de leur invite en les invitant à intégrer le volet droit numérique. Parce que avant, euh, je faisais un travail de recherche où je ne faisais que dresser la carte des droits numériques. Alors, euh, je me suis dit que maintenant, il faut la situation des droits numériques, donc il faudrait maintenant passer euh, à un volet où il faut maintenant conduire des actions de plaidoyer et comme les, les, le Burundi avait des organisations très impliquées dans les droits humains, je me suis, et qui, sont, qui étaient très dynamiques dans le domaine du plaidoyer, je me suis dit qu'il faudrait euh, les impliquer. Alors, pour ce faire, euh, je, je les contactais, je leur disais euh, le, le nouvel aspect des droits humains, donc la, le volet numérique des, des droits humains. Je leur euh, parlais par exemple de la déclaration euh, africaine des droits numériques, cette déclaration qui a été faite par les organisations de la société civile africaine. Je leur parlais de, de la résolution des Nations Unies. Il y a une résolution du, con, du Conseil des droits de l'homme des Nations Unies sur les droits numériques. Donc là, pour les introduire, pour leur dire qu'il y a un mouvement déjà en cours euh, dans le domaine des droits numériques, et je leur... Euh, et la réaction, la réaction que j'ai eue, d'abord j'ai contacté une organisation de, de femmes, puis des organisations de jeunes, et puis des journalistes aussi. Alors, comme résultat, j'ai trouvé que toutes ces organisations 
se disaient intéressés par son nouveau domaine. Donc, ils étaient prêts à, prêts à travailler pour les, euh, la question, les questions des droits numériques. Euh, <coughs> Euh, L'organisation des droits des femmes, euh, qui, qui travaille dans les droits, pour les droits des femmes, euh, elle, elle avait déjà euh, initié des centres d'accès à, à l'information dans le milieu rural. Alors là, j'ai dit qu'il faut vraiment euh, construire sur ce, cette expérience et continuer dans le domaine. Euh, et puis, il y a euh, les, les journalistes, ils se sont, comme ils, étaient, ils ont été confrontés à des à la censure parfois. Il y a par exemple un, un journal qui a un forum en ligne qui a été bloqué. Alors, ils se sont dit vraiment, on, on, on souhaiterait vraiment euh, contribuer à, à, la, à la protection des droits en ligne. C'est ça. Excellent, merci. Um, I'll summarize in English, but I think what I took away from that was when reaching out to more traditional human rights organizations or women's rights organizations, speak to them with tools that they already understand. So if there's international human rights law that exists that they might not be aware of, let them know about that so that it seems like something that they can easily kind of latch on to. We're at the point in the day where I'm just going to make hand motions instead of using words. Um, and Emmanuel, you do uh, have taken on the large project of trying to pass a digital rights and freedom bill in Togo. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you're going about that process and how you're getting people kind of on board and building coalitions, because that's a huge, huge project. Okay, I think, okay, let me speak French too. To be fair to everyone, <laughs> yeah. No pressure. <coughs> du coup, uh, dans le cadre du Togo, c'est... Enfin, c'est un pays euh, à part entière. Est, on est, euh, notre île n'est pas sur la planète parce qu'on a nos manières de procéder et on a nos propres designs, comme on le dit. Tout a commencé euh, par euh, le forum de la gouvernance de l'Internet, dont je suis le président d'organisation. Et durant ces forums, d'abord avant le forum, j'ai collaboré avec euh, l'AGF Academy pour essayer de définir euh, une sorte de curricula, c'est-à-dire euh, les anglais disent le curriculum, pour essayer de voir à peu près les, les bonnes pratiques ailleurs pour euh, un forum multipartite. Donc, euh, on a essayé de définir ce document qui a été publié ensemble avec euh, les autres acteurs sur le terrain, la société civile, la communauté technique, le gouvernement, et le régulateur. Donc, au sorti de ça, on a essayé quand même d'avoir des forums multipartites où toutes ces parties étaient représentées, c'est-à-dire le gouvernement est présent, la société civile est présente. Donc, on a eu celui de 2016 et celui de l'année dernière, 2018. Donc, en 2018, ce que j'ai essayé de, de faire, c'est d'intégrer, en, en, entre guillemets, les questions de droit numérique. Parce que, pendant cette période, le pays avait déjà subi euh, les coupures d'Internet. Et il était très important d'ouvrir le débat. Parce que c'est... Il y a une question d'ignorance, d'abord et une question d'incompréhension. Donc, j'ai essayé quand même de, de voir comment est-ce qu'on peut ouvrir le débat. Parler des droits numériques, est-ce que l'Internet, comment ça doit être régulé Est-ce qu'il y a un droit ailleurs Comment ça se fait ailleurs Comment ça se fait chez nous Donc, j'ai essayé quand même d'ouvrir ce débat large et je pense que ça a été vraiment un débat très cordial entre le gouvernement et les acteurs Maintenant que nous savons que voilà, c'est un droit, c'est-à-dire des citoyens, et que voilà, le pays n'est pas un pays qui doit s'isoler, on doit nécessairement réguler le secteur, alors qu'est-ce qu'on doit faire Ce sont les questions qu'on a posées lors du forum pour avoir les recommandations, c'est-à-dire les idées des uns des autres. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez Si vous pensez que vraiment ce sont des droits, comme on l'a dit tout à l'heure, alors passons à l'action, c'est-à-dire euh, essayons de définir un code dans lequel on peut librement et largement discuter de ça pour permettre au fait aux juges d'initier de, 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 des actions, par exemple, des actions en justice, le juge euh, peut utiliser la constitution, peut utiliser le code pénal, peut utiliser n'importe ce qu'il veut. Et quelqu'un, par exemple, qui a publié euh, une blague, par exemple, en ligne, peut finir avec une peine de mort. Donc, c est, c est, c est... on a vu des exemples dans d'autres pays et on ne va pas attendre que ça arrive chez nous. Par exemple, quand je prends le cas du Cameroun, il y a eu des jeunes qui ont fait des blagues 
sur le téléphone que Boko Haram recrute. Ces jeunes sont en prison et attendent une peine de mort. C'est parce que c'est ce que le, 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 comment appelle -on, le tribunal militaire en a décidé et ce sont les dispositifs légaux qui existent. Alors on s'est dit, dans notre pays, il va falloir introduire un code qui définit, entre guillemets, euh, qu'est-ce qu'on va considérer comme délit, qu'est-ce qu'on va considérer comme crime et essayer quand même de laisser cette liberté qui protège en fait les utilisateurs. Donc on a discuté avec les acteurs, surtout euh, la communauté technique, la société civile, et on a décidé ensemble, euh, il serait bien, il serait bien euh, de faire une proposition de loi, soumettre aux parlementaires, parce que ça, euh, je ne sais pas comment ça se passe dans d'autres pays, mais nos parlementaires sont très paresseux, entre guillemets, et ils n'initient jamais des projets de loi, et si le gouvernement en décide, c'est peut-être un partenaire qui l'a exigé. Peut-être les états unis disent, euh, pour avoir ce grant, nous voulons vraiment, par exemple pour le, le, le Millennium Challenge, ils exigent un certain nombre de dispositions et c'est là que vous allez voir des projets de loi qui sortent de nulle part, qui, entre guillemets, n'ont pas eu des sessions de lecture euh, d'avant, lecture et tout, et qu'on vote. Donc, l'idée a été de, de commencer une approche bottom-up, c'est-à-dire euh, essayer de collecter les recommandations des uns des autres. Si vous êtes dans la communauté technique, qu'est-ce que vous pensez peut être dans ce code-là pour vous protéger si vous êtes de la société civile, qui, qui entre guillemets, est la voix des utilisateurs, qu'est-ce que vous suggérez avoir dans le code Si vous êtes le gouvernement et vous pensez que l'Internet est une menace, qu'est-ce que vous pensez avoir dans le code, entre guillemets, qui va vous permettre, en cas de ces situations, de les gérer Donc ça a été quand même un débat euh, qui a été... Ouvert. Et puis, il y a eu aussi des consultations individuelles, c'est-à-dire euh, des organisations euh, comme des chapitres de cas Amnesty International, le CACIT, c'est-à-dire les organisations au plan national, essayer de discuter avec eux des one-on-one -on -one pour voir qu'est-ce qu'ils qu qu pensent réellement de ça. J'ai même essayé de, avec euh, mon organisation, essayer de contacter des chancelleries, l'ambassade des États-Unis euh, à Lomé. En tant que chancellerie, vous êtes dans le pays, vous avez observé, vous avez vu ce qui se passe. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez d'un tel projet, qu'est-ce que vous pensez euh, d'une telle proposition Donc, on a essayé de, quand même de recueillir euh, ces avis et ensemble, euh, on a confié le projet aux universitaires. Parce que moi, bon, je ne suis pas juriste. Du coup, on a confié le projet aux universitaires. C'est vous qui écrivez nos tests. Alors, pour éviter de duplication, ou bien comment on le dit, de duplication de tests, parce que la loi ne peut être appliquée qu'une fois. C'est-à-dire, euh, donc, regardez nos tests qu'on a et ce qu'on n'a pas ajouter le dessus pour qu'on ait quand même un code qui protège les, les, les utilisateurs et au même moment ne menace pas aussi euh, les gouvernants. Donc ça a été euh, le travail en cours, ce n'est pas encore euh, terminé, c'est un grand projet, alors on espère bien, <rire> on espère bien euh, arriver à terme, mais l'objectif quand même c'est d'avoir à terme un code euh, qui protège et euh, après on pourra penser à comment exécuter ça. Excellent. C'est en effet un, un très grand projet. Ouais. Um, ce que j'en sors, or what I would take from this in terms of lessons learned that can maybe be applied elsewhere, is a piece about being, and this, again, it's a huge project, about being proactive. So not waiting for the government to kind of implement restrictive laws, but to propose actively something to them that will shape your vision of how you want digital rights to look. We have about 30 minutes left. I, at this point, I think we can maybe turn towards the audience and start with maybe if anyone had any questions of our panelists. Um, otherwise, I would love to hear from you about your success stories, things that you would like people here to know that they can maybe leverage for their own contexts. So while you think about that, I'll take any questions that people might have. No questions? Great. Fantastic. Thank you. I just thought we had been incredibly thorough, so. You, you have been, <laughs> so you have been. Um, So I was just uh, wondering for each of you and for you know folks in the audience as well, um, what kind of support is most needed as you pursue your causes? And you know, maybe it's money or you know, um, relationships, things like that. But in, while you've been doing your work, what have you found to be most um, something that you've noticed is lacking or something that this community could support you um, in, in pursuing? 
Perfect. I'll take, if there's any more questions, I'll take those. Otherwise, I think that's a fantastic thing we can talk about. Perfect. Um, what kind of support do you need? Yeah, I'm tempted to say, like, like automatically, that it's money, but but <laughs> uh, yeah, but but for us, I think the, we're leaning more on the digital inclusion side. We need to take as many people as, as possible online. Um, as, as I said earlier, I think it's, it's just 10% um, uh, of the population has got access to the internet. So we need more people online. We need more people to create uh, content. And and for us as, as tech people, it's also our uh, these are our customers. If if we are coming up with solutions and we're only targeting 10% of the population, that means uh, it affects the revenue that we we we're generating at the end of the day. So we've got packages that we're doing um, what we're calling them digital skill packages. So we'd have uh, specific packages for maybe entrepreneurs, uh, digital skills for students, for media, uh, with the aim of helping them to understand the space a little bit more. Uh, than, than just uh, maybe getting online without necessarily understanding what they're doing. So we, as part of that digital skills package, we include the digital rights um, information in all that. So I, I think the, the, the good start would be to get support on how best we can reach more people with these packages, um, we, which to, to, a, to an extent is financial, but we also need some equipment that these people can easily use um, at, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, Alors, euh, euh, merci Niki pour la question. Je, je vais dire que quant au le type d'appui dont on aurait besoin dans le cadre de, de ces initiatives citoyennes, c'est... Oui, on a la tendance, bon, du moins c'est la tendance naturelle, parce que l'argent est le nerf de la guerre, c'est de dire, oui, on, on a besoin d'argent, ça, ça va de soi. Si on n'avait pas d'argent, on ne serait pas ici d'ailleurs. Euh, tout au moins parce qu'il faut, il faut voyager mais je vais dire que je crois que ce dont on a besoin compte tenu de la nature spécifique du sujet que nous traitons et qui est à la croisée des chemins entre les droits humains et la technologie donc euh, la complexité ne va pas en diminuant ça il faut, faut, faut le dire on voit bien toutes ces questions qui se lèvent aujourd'hui autour de euh, ce que Facebook, Google, tout ça, qu'est-ce qu'ils font de nos données, c'est des choses qui, c'est des thématiques qui viennent, qui naissent à un moment donné. Donc, euh, quand je regarde ces problématiques, je me dis qu'on a prioritairement besoin euh, d'avoir du, du, de, des appuis pour acquérir un niveau d'expertise qui donne aux initiatives que nous entreprenons de la crédibilité. Parce que pour, pour échanger avec le gouvernement, dans ce cadre, si je prends les projets qu'Emmanuel a ou que nous avons au Cameroun pour essayer de, de produire un texte de loi qui encadre quand même les droits et qui dit également les devoirs du citoyen, on a besoin d'être crédible. Et cette crédibilité découle naturellement du, de la capacité que tu démontres. Si nous sommes capables de démontrer que nous comprenons le sujet et que nous sommes capables, notamment à cause de sa nouveauté, à cause de sa récence, que nous sommes capables de la, ça dit que de la mâcher et de la donner à des acteurs qui travaillent avec nous et qui ne sont pas nécessairement au fait de ces questions. Ça, c'est l'autre chose qu'il faut se dire. Je pense qu'en ce moment, on peut accroître notre crédibilité et donc notre efficacité dans la, la démarche en question, de manière à ne pas simplement... Euh, plaquer des choses que nous aurions apprises par ailleurs, dans des forats comme ceux-ci ou des forats internationaux, mais que nous soyons capables d'amener une contextualisation et aussi de marcher un peu dans la chaussure de nos, de nos gouvernants. Parce que la réalité, c'est que nous ne sommes pas au même niveau d'évolution technologique ou d'utilisation de la technologie que les pays occidentaux, qui sont pour la plupart les initiateurs de la plupart des lois que nous rencontrons au niveau international, ou bien au DNI, ou bien n'importe où. Donc, il y a lieu qu que nous ayons de l'expertise. Et je pense que si on a cet appui, on peut avoir l'argent aussi, parce qu'on est, je, je, je crois qu'on avait un panel précédent qui évoquait le financement de la société civile. Si on a de l'expertise, et qu'on peut prouver, qu'on peut produire des résultats avec cette expertise, on aura aussi de la crédibilité à l'égard des bailleurs de fonds, mais on aura aussi la crédibilité à l'égard des citoyens, pour nous écouter et pour avoir confiance en la démarche que nous avons. Ça, c'est ce que je crois. Merci. Merci.
Okay, thank you for that question. Um, for us, like uh, what we're doing is like advocacy and also training of people to understand this using participatory approach, like empowering people. Sometimes you will have certain things, but you don't know the need, and then you wouldn't even take good care of it. So we need support in terms of training, reaching out to more people. Like I remember when we had the F Digital Rights Forum in January, we like catered for like 70 people, but we had more than 100 people who subscribed to this, and most of them are key players in, in, uh, in the society that when they are empowered with information concerning digital rights, they would be very useful to, to, to the cause that we're doing. Because we shouldn't just wait when there's internet shutdown, network disruption, to be part of this initiative. So we need to reach out to more people to empower, if we can, everyone in the society, because one way or the other, we're all affected by internet shutdown, uh, network disruption, cost of internet, and everything, because it's, it's a chain that is interrelated, the health sector and all these other sectors are involved. So we need support in, in that aspect, and also um, high-level trainings, like in engaging most of these senior stakeholders, like the policy makers, the government, because sometimes it's difficult. These are people, for instance, lawmakers, that do not understand some of the basic tenets of these things, and then you need like proper engagement to, to involve them and also security officials because sometimes if some people are in trouble with perceive the law, they're the one who take care of this. Sometimes you can be right but they don't know because they're just executing orders. So it is important we train them also more security officers to know some of these things. Like for instance, if in the constitution it says you should not shut down the internet and then they they are asked to implement some of those things, but they know no, this is unconstitutional because they are empowered in, in, in achieving some of those things. Yeah. Got you. Thank you. Okay. I will not start with uh, money, but money is needed. I think <laughs> it's needed everywhere. The the kind of uh, support we need. Sometime uh, in our case, for example. I I don't think the money comes first. I think uh, we need technical support. What do I mean by technical support? I think they mention it. We need to build our capacity because it's like building someone's capacity while you are building yourself your capacity because we are all almost new in this. It came to us, as I said earlier, as a democracy. We hear that well, there's democracy everywhere and we want it in our space too. But do we really understand it. Do we really get the consequences? So we need that kind of technical support where like in the case of Togo, Parliament Initiative, I reach out to them every day to actually learn from the experience because I think the, the coalition Parliament Initiative did in Nigeria, for example, for the Nigerian bill, is one of the best experience on the continent. So those kind of technical support where we can learn from where they fall so we shouldn't fall in the same parts and uh, the second one that come is now the financial support because the organizations on the local level is true when you discuss with them they are willing to participate they are okay to go with you but where are they getting the money from nowhere so at the end of the day you end up having a very good idea you but it will not move forward because you need people to work on it you need Lawyers, you need a lot of people behind the project for it to move. So we need those. Those are the main support we need: technical support to build our capacities ourselves first, and the financial support to actually support it. The other support we may also need, especially in Francophone Africa perspective, because in Francophone Africa, it's usually who is behind the project. That's usually the questions that come. So why is he doing it? What's his motivation doing it? So it comes when you are in a coalition, not just as civil society, but when you're in a coalition where, as I was saying, the US embassy, I discussed with them, are you good to go with us? If you are good, it's OK. So when the government knows that, OK, the German government is behind this, the US government is behind this, they give it a weight. They don't just think that, okay, it's a group of frustrated citizens who are coming out with a bill to disturb the government. 
they actually realize that okay, it's something that is supported by serious organizations, serious people are behind it, and that credibility Charlie talk about right now is also a problem for us as civil society because we don't have uh, some of us we don't have a very good record, you know, when it comes to how we manage our funds, how we actually produce our reports. So all those kind of things I think we need a kind of capacity. I think internews do it very well where they keep sending emails and co but the organization they will not send you an email. They are expecting to see how you are going to do it and how you are going to come out with the reports. So I think it's very important to build the capacity of civil society in all those areas before we take off with our projects. What I heard is if you're a frustrated group of citizens, find some credible backing and then you'll be taken more seriously. Jean-Paul, est-ce que tu voulais ajouter quelque chose? Merci. Je veux être bref pour ne pas répéter ce que les autres ont dit. Donc la, la formation, le renforcement des capacités, euh, parce que c'est un nouveau domaine euh, que nous allons entreprendre. Euh, donc euh, le domaine du plaidoyer, mais aussi que nous puissions être soutenus pour, euh, donc au niveau financier, aussi pour et surtout pour euh, le réseautage. Donc si que si le, les partenaires euh, qui sont en contact avec nous ont des autres partenaires qui peuvent nous aider, qui nous aident à les contacter. Donc, c'est donc le réseautage pour qu'ils nous présentent maintenant aux autres partenaires qui peuvent nous aider. Voilà. Excellent, merci. Um, is there any other questions? Okay, we actually have more now. Uh, gentleman in the green shirt and then gentleman in the red shirt. We'll take both of them and then answer. So the biggest beneficiaries of digital rights are the citizens, and a large portion of those people will be the youths of the country. Now, I want to ask, has there ever been instances where the beneficiaries act against the promotion of digital rights in your country? And if yes, how did you overcome that challenge? All right, and I will take the one other question, and we can try and answer them both at the same time. Okay, there's a third Thank question. You. Uh, Digital rights uh, inclusion has been done uh, in s other countries for years, and they have been aware of the opportunity and the challenges that they, they had. So I would like to know, as a new individual, what can I do to ensure that uh, my home government and the citizen know that the digital right is important for both the country and human rights uh, promotion. Thank you. Excellent. And there's just one more question over here. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abiodun Thorp. And um, I would like to ask, uh, so typically we think of government uh, when, uh, as a big obstacle to um, promotion of digital rights. Uh, but then I want us to look at the um, other areas, like remote areas where we have people who, number one, um, need this um, message. Um, and um, so how will you be able to overcome the challenges of the people in the remote areas that have, uh, don't see the need for, you know, education for uh, digital rights because the most um, news or information they've gotten from the so-called internet had always been like bad news, or, or, and as a result, uh, typically go against um, those kind of education of their people. So I'm talking about gatekeepers in remote areas, especially where connectivity is a major challenge, and um, the, as a result of that, uh, they sort of like do not want that kind of education. If any of you have had such unique challenge in remote areas, have I, how have you been able to um, deal with that and uh, what are the successful outcomes uh, in those things? Uh, just so I understand, is your question how you teach people in rural areas about the importance of digital rights in the internet? Is that? The, the, 
the education of digital right in remote areas for them to you know have the digital inclusion um, curriculum ingrained into them such that when they go online they understand their rights and they know how to be able to approach um, the 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 um, they, they are right online when it is being infringed on because usually most of them do not Th know that's perfect right, yeah. I just want to make sure that I, I got yeah. it no I yeah. love that question and I think that gets to the core of what a lot of us are trying to do um, we have 19 minutes left you're not all gonna be able to speak to all three questions so Elio do you want to take the last one okay thank you very much sir. Uh, for us we have like different approaches that we've been using uh, on this radio. digital rights initiative like we have a radio program that reach out to people that are not even having access to internet because everyone is connected in the country using radio and then you know people use more whatsapp a lot in our country it's a lot it's been a decider in the previous elections and some other activities that people do communication sending messages and passing out information to other people so we do a radio program where every week we invite an expert on a particular area relating to digital rights a lawyer a technician someone in the civil service and then we will have like an hour conversation concerning digital rights and tell what are their rights when it comes to digital rights and some of the things that they're actually using relating to digital rights that they are unaware of and then most of the feedback we have is really good like they will call to ask certain questions that we take for granted because we know but is there someone in a village that doesn't know sometimes they will have network disruption maybe the telecommunications company is not even aware of some of these things so we involve them like the telcos in the country i've seen like i personally taking that initiative to talk to some of these telcos concerning data and connectivity issues and it's like it's an ongoing process and you know things are a little bit improving bit by bit and we hope like with more stakeholder engagement initiatives like those radios hopefully like having tv programs too where people can watch have this conversation where you do not have to wait until when you have problem with some of these network issues where everyone is affected to come out to talk about it but let it be like a continuous process where people because it's like everyday issue today we before we were not talking about artificial intelligence now it's in the conversation so you don't have to wait for some of those things to come to start talking about them so those are one of the means that we've been using and then to the brother's question about uh, if people that you've been telling uh, that benefits from this digital rights come against it most of the time if I understand your question is about understanding it because the problems that we do have maybe it will be like security officials that uh, some that's supposed to protect the communities but in favor of maybe the government also they will go against it but at the end of the day they sometimes need this more because maybe there is a crime somewhere else someone would need like a whatsapp message to send to the police station or something like that so it's about engagement engaging them more and more tell them this is your right things that we take for granted that they don't know involving them more i believe with time like we've been registering <laughs> progress it's gonna work Merci. Someone else want to talk? You're good. Yeah, um, I just want to chip in. It, it's, it's a question of value. Um, so wh what we do, uh, apart from maybe going um, with the message of digital rights alone, what we do is, is we embed it in the value that they're going to get when they go online, especially in the rural areas. Because um, we were looking, they're looking at priorities. To, to some, they look at internet as not the priority that they have at the, at the moment. Maybe they've got other priorities. But with a lot of services going online now, even including farming uh, messages, they, they get to know like prices and all that. And, and when they are online, that's when they start to meet these um, um, abuses or, or whatever it is that is violating their rights and all that. So we, we kind of um, start with the value message and then end up with the, the, the digital rights that they need to uh, protect when, when they are there, but they also need to um, uh, think about them at the end of the day. Yeah, um, quickly, I think I, I should invite you all uh, to Malawi, at least virtually. We'll be having elections very shortly, and, and uh, Zem Hub, we've deployed a system um, that, that is, is going to monitor elections, I think, uh, using 8,000 observers. People will be sending reports and, and, and all, um, more like an election situation room that we should be getting. So it's, it's already um, a heated environment, and, and you all activists, at least, we should support us, uh, because there's already talk of leaking, fake news, and, and all that that is, is taking place. So we, we really need your support in, in that space that we can easily work together. Thank you. So I think Vincent just invited us to his place in Malawi, so I'll see you all in Malawi shortly. Um, 
Charlie, can I ask you to speak briefly about how in Cameroon you've balanced the kind of citizens' rights to the internet and people pushing back against it in the context of national security and free expression? Briefly. Merci. Euh, C'est vrai que lorsque nous faisions l'une des premières formations sur les droits digitaux, on a eu des, des participants qui, euh, qui n'avaient pas le même avis, qui, qui pensaient que les droits là, allaient trop loin par rapport à... et qui évoquaient justement, hein, prêt, tu, tu dois savoir, et qui évoquaient justement le fait qu'il faut quand même que la sécurité nationale soit protégée. Et, et d'ailleurs, et ils avaient, je dis qu'ils avaient des raisons de le dire, puisqu'ils venaient des zones où il y a la guerre, et qu'ils avaient bien vu euh, euh, qu'en plus... Les réseaux sociaux, d'après leur perception, ils pensaient que les réseaux sociaux avaient servi à amplifier les messages de haine qu'il y avait. Et ils le disaient. Et je pense que, comment est-ce qu'il faut répondre à ce genre de, de préoccupation je, je, je pense que la première réponse, c'est d'écouter. Parce que euh, souvent, on a la tendance de penser que l'autre a, euh, a tort directement. Lorsqu'on est... Vous savez qu'il y a une convention ici, nous sommes tous d'accord ici qu'on a besoin des droits digitaux. Donc si on entend quelqu'un ici dire euh, que non, on va trop loin, je suis sûr que nous allons tous nous tourner pour le regarder. Mais dans ce cas-là, je pense qu'il faut il l'écouter faut et écouter son avis. Parce que l'avis qu'il formulait était quand même un avis euh, qui était informé. Et je pense que celui qui s'opposait, c'était quelqu'un qui... c'était un journaliste radio. Donc quelqu'un qui est au fait justement de la qualité ou du moins de l'impact de la communication sur la société. Non, ce qu'on a entrepris de faire, et je pense que c'est ce qu'on évoque ici depuis, quelques, depuis, quelques, depuis deux jours, ce qu'on a entrepris de faire, c'est de faire la démonstration que, euh, premièrement, les, les droits que l'on évoque doivent être des droits qui sont incompressibles. C'est-à-dire que ça doit être des droits qui sont rendus disponibles par le fait même de notre humanité, parce que ça fait partie du droit de communiquer, du droit de participer à la chose publique, du droit d'utiliser les réseaux de communication comme on veut, dans l'intention qui nous sied. Et que s'il y a des corrections à apporter, des limitations à apporter à l'expression qui va contre l'intérêt humain, il faut trouver un autre mécanisme, parce qu'il n'est pas encore démontré aujourd'hui que quand vous coupez les réseaux de communication, la haine s'arrête. C'est ça le, le vrai problème. Et je pense que c'est pour ça que nous évoquons ce, ce, l'expertise, les capacités que la société civile ou les défenseurs des droits digitaux doivent avoir. Ils doivent savoir quels sont les types de réponses à apporter ou à formuler devant des préoccupations qui sont tout aussi légitimes. Quand vous regardez ce qui s'est passé au Sri Lanka, ce n'est pas très différent de ce que nous on a au Cameroun, où des gens utilisent les réseaux pour euh, euh, entretenir leur propre haine de l'autre. Et donc, il y a lieu que nous soyons plus capables d'expliquer et de montrer aux gens que lorsqu'on a coupé Internet, lorsque, si l'État coupe Internet pour des raisons sécuritaires, il n'arrange pas le problème de fond, qui est celui, euh, celui, du, celui de la haine que les gens entretiennent entre eux. Et il faut que l'État s'arrange à trouver un autre mécanisme sans empêcher les gens de jouir du droit de communiquer, du droit de, de partager, du droit d'échanger au quotidien ou du droit de faire des affaires. Parce que le jour où vous avez coupé Internet, comme ça a été le cas dans mon pays pour euh, les questions de sécurité, euh, nous avons fait une recherche qui a été d'ailleurs financée par Internews. On a fait une recherche sur l'impact socio-économique avant que CIPESA ne nous donne l'outil euh, qu'il nous donne aujourd'hui. On a fait une étude, une recherche sur l'impact socio-économique de la coupure d'Internet au Cameroun et les résultats étaient au-dessus de 400 milliards de francs CFA en trois, en trois, en trois mois, qui montre bien qu'on avait détruit le tissu économique local et qui va donc amplifier automatiquement la haine, la haine de l'autre et plus de violence encore et plus de, plus de situations de crise. Donc, je pense que c'est cette expertise et cette capacité à apporter une réponse paisible qui doit nous permettre de, 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 de circonvenir à, à l'opposition que les uns et les autres peuvent avoir quand on évoque les droits digitaux. Merci. Awesome. We have a couple minutes left. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions if there are any. Otherwise, I think we might wrap up maybe a couple minutes early. Any last minute questions? No? All right, perfect. So I hope what you've taken, or not perfect, if you have questions, that's totally fine. Um, did you have a question? 
Sadiq, all the way at the back. Uh, thank you. It, it's been a very interesting session. I'm just wondering what do you think uh, is the future of digital rights uh, in, in Africa and specifically in your country? Do you think, uh, do you see positive development in the space or are you pessimistic? Wow, closing it out with the easy questions there, Sadiq. Who wants, Emmanuel? Okay, thank you, Sadiq. I think. <laughs> Speak positive at the end. Yeah. <laughs> I think is the question you ask is true, and I always stick with my word, internet or digital right or all those things came to us as how democracy came. It's like you asking someone in 1999, what's the future of democracy in Africa? I think the same thing applied to digital rights today. And it depends on how the changes are going on in the country when you come to the political landscape, the government. I don't think if, for example, today, Fonya Singbe leave power in Togo or Bia leave power and there's a new change of government, the process will be still the same now. Because they are using two different tactics. When you look at Ghana, which is a neighboring country, the way they manage the country when it comes to digital rights is not the same in Togo because somewhere the person know four years later he may not be president, he become a common citizen. But when you come three hours more to Togo, you see a person who is there for 52 years and he he's fighting to survive. It's the problem with Cameroon. So the future will depend on how we build our institutions, how we build our democracy. I think the digital right will come with it automatically. I firmly believe on that. Okay, positive thoughts. We have, I know we, you all have deep thoughts on this. We have only a couple minutes left, so if you maybe want to close out with this question, Charlie, I'll go to you next, quickly. Hello. Moi, je vais clôturer ma, mes propos en apportant une réponse à la question d'Adé, en disant que euh, je, je, je pense qu'il y a une évolution mécanique à laquelle personne ne peut échapper. C'est mécanique. Le changement, c'est vrai, le changement est inscrit dans la nature. On peut changer pour le pire, on peut changer pour le bien. Ça dépend simplement de l'énergie que vous mettez dans la direction du changement. Donc ça, ça va de soi. Mais pour ce qui touche euh, cette évolution euh, que nous voyons et qui est globale, parce qu'on est aujourd'hui un seul village, je crois que ça a été dit dans le résumé de notre session, dans le document, on ne peut pas échapper à l'évolution des droits. Des droits, qu'ils soient digitaux ou non digitaux, les droits vont évoluer mécaniquement. Ça veut dire quoi Que si je prends un exemple, il y a 20 ans, on résolvait les problèmes d'alternance en Afrique en faisant les coups d'État. Aujourd'hui, vous ne pouvez pas faire un coup d'État. Il y a toujours les militaires, il y a toujours les armes, mais vous ne pouvez plus faire de coup d'État. Vous faites un coup d'État, vous êtes hors jeu. Alors, quand, ça vient, quand on en vient à la question des droits, quand vous regardez la proportion des jeunes dans tous les pays du monde, on a entre 40 et 60% de la jeunesse. Donc, il y a une demande des droits humains à laquelle les vieux qui nous gouvernent là ne peuvent pas résister. Donc, mécaniquement, on aura les droits digitaux beaucoup plus larges en Afrique demain qu'on en a aujourd'hui. Merci. Yeah, um, for, for, for my country, Malawi, I'm, I'm very optimistic uh, because we've seen a lot of positive, positive moves uh, for the past uh, five or so years. Um, like I said, we've passed a, a number of registrations, and now we're talking about the Digital uh, Protection Act that, that is, is being um, drafted. So we, we're very positive in, in that space, but also uh, because we're kind of playing catch up because of the um, low internet penetration rate, the lack of infrastructure and all that, we've got an opportunity to get things right from the beginning. That's, that's what we're taking to the people now, that uh, we're learning from experience from other countries, maybe we can do it a little bit better because we've got all the time, we've got all the opportunities uh, that we can do things a, a little bit well. So that's why we're taking the messages of, of digital skills, digital rights and digital inclusion to the people that they should have the 
whole picture when they're getting online for the first time. So we, we're very positive on, on, on that. Thank you. Do you. Did you both want it? Quickly, there's like two minutes left. Uh, à propos du futur des de droits numériques, moi, euh, je, suis, je suis optimiste. Je suis optimiste, mais il faut que, donc, avoir l'énergie qu'on commence à y mettre pour, euh, pour pousser dans le domaine. Je, donc, euh, l'avenir est, est, est meilleur dans le domaine. Il faut agir, notamment, former euh, la jeune génération, euh, profiter, par exemple, du fait que les jeunes générations actuellement ils sont en train d'être formés au niveau des écoles primaires par exemple chez nous depuis l'école primaire on, commence, on a commencé à introduire le cours de, de technologie de l'information il faudrait, il faudrait qu'on agisse pour qu'on introduise un peu le volet des droits numériques pour que la jeune génération s'en approprie donc je suis optimiste Make it positive. Yeah, I'm positive about it. Um, we, where we were today, we were not there like a few years ago, and then tomorrow will always be another day. But regardless, there will be challenges based on different interests of our political leaders, policy makers, and lawmakers. So we just need to keep pushing, and engaging more stakeholders in educating the population, starting from the bottom up. I'm sure we will get there some days where some of the things that we're complaining today, we'll be having new problems to deal with. Thank you. Did you want something? Will you? I think it's the same feeling. The, somebody says it's mechanic. It's turning, so if they will not live, they will definitely die. They will not live, you know, forever. I'm not wishing it, but it's automatic. It's how it is. So they, they will go, and I think there's a generation, and we are going to lead tomorrow. I don't know your ambitions, but I'm going to lead, definitely. And we start to have to build our capacity now and build the capacity of our fellow young people so that tomorrow when we get there, we should feel the pain as they feel it down. Thank you. Awesome. I, th I felt like some people wanted to clap when you said, we were I don't know about you, but I'm going to lead tomorrow. And I love finishing on that kind of note of hope. So I hope what you've able, been able to take from this panel today is kind of some lessons learned and some strategies that maybe can be applied in different contexts. I love the thing that Vincent said at the very end. We started talking about how there's a very low internet penetration rate in a lot of countries. That's been really kind of uh, an impediment to talking about digital rights. But I like the way that you framed the end of this by saying that that's really an opportunity to get things right from the beginning. Um, so that's what I'm going to take away from this. Hopefully this proved useful to all of you, and uh, thank you for attending, and thank you guys.